So then I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, which is Michiel Jong. Hi, Michiel. Uh, Michiel is, where is my, here's my sheet. Uh, Michiel Jong is founder of Ponder Source, um, co-founder of the project Federated Bookkeeping. Um, co-developed the privacy awareness plugin Terms of Service Didn't Read for um, Firefox and has worked on um, data handling at uh, the Solid Project, where he built Datapods and Ripple. So he's now a new guy in the decentralized space, uh, so to say. Um, and I asked Michiel, uh, we asked him to uh, present um, some of his experiences with these projects and how and why, especially the why, and they were built in such a manner uh, with data awareness in mind. Um, Again, feel free to ask questions during this workshop. It's going to be interactive. Um, please use the, you can use the Q&A uh, option in below in Zoom. Um, and otherwise the Discord's also open if you're active there. So take it away, Michiel. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, uh, what I'm working at now is uh, Pondersource, which is a small company that is a post-growth nonprofit uh, because you know, this year we went to the um, uh, blockchain incubator at this center, Utrecht, and uh, contrary to what uh, Melanie Rebeck said, we didn't get the slide about the hockey stick curve going up to the right. We got a talk from Melanie Rebeck telling us, like, uh, you shouldn't think about it that way. You know, you, this venture capital, that's not the only way, you know. And then, no, obviously, they got all of us thinking, and I... Um, Kept, that was, I kept thinking about her presentation uh, the rest of the weeks and I had another call with her where she explained some of the concepts a bit more and answered like a list of my questions. And then so uh, then I decided to make uh, Ponder Source a nonprofit company. And uh, that's where we are now. I'll, um, in this uh, presentation, I'll show, I'll try to tell you a little bit, a bit about what I've worked on in the past and, and where I'm now if I can uh, click play here. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to start with is why do anything? Why do, I, why do anything in general? So why would you uh, choose? How do you choose what you will do in your, in your work? So uh, one uh, school of thought that I came across uh, recently is called effective altruism which starts from the assumption that um, you want to improve the world. You want to do something for other people. Uh, you want to output something positive. And a lot of people get very enthusiastic when they have an idea about, okay, this is what I want to build and I invented it and it's going to be great. It's going to be, so many people are going to be helped with it. And that's, you need that enthusiasm, of course, but you also need some, uh, some science to it. So effective altruism says like, well, when we um, do business or we do serious stuff that we're always measuring and we're always um, keeping statistics, but when we do charity or we wanna uh, do something amazing to change the world, then suddenly it's all enthusiasm and volunteers. Um, uh, part of it's when you volunteer, uh, then it's sort of an extra gift. So nobody is gonna tell you that you shouldn't do it or you should do something else or that you should do it differently. Uh, but this also hurts how altruism um, uh, can be effective. So um, one of the stories that this book about effective altruism uh, quotes is about a, a project that was called Play Pump. And um, the idea of Play Pump is great. You, um, in, in some African villages, there's a lack of drinking water and uh, usually the women would have to go get the drinking water at the well and they have to carry it on their heads and um, it's a lot of work. And um, also there's not so much toys to play with for kids. So this, um, uh, this charity said, well, let's solve two problems within one go. We, pay, we build a play pump where kids can just run around and, and uh, use it as a carousel, but at the same time, it pumps up the water. And um, they built this thing and then they got crowdfunding and they got donations and they got good reviews and they were on the newspapers and uh, 
um, some politicians back them and uh, they build all those play pumps and um, in lots of villages. And then um, uh, uh, one or two years later, they came back and they say, hey, why aren't you using the play pump to, you know, to play and to pump water? And then in some villages, they saw that um, the mothers were actually walking around the play pump and they would uh, get dizzy and end up throwing up because of so many um, rounds they had to walk. And um, in other villages, it was just broken. And there would not be, because it's such a special design, there wouldn't be local tools to fix it. And um, the this contrast with the old pumps that they would use normally, which uh, were actually cheaper to build, they could be um, fixed locally uh, with local tools and uh, they were easier to, to use. You could pump more water um, as a grown up using them. And the reason the kids didn't want to play with these play pubs is that the, the reason of um, a carousel is fun is that because if you turn it and you jump on it, then you go round and round and round and round. And it's, um, it just keeps going. That's what, it, that's what the, and then you, you got the G-forces, that's what the fun of the carousel is. But with these carousels, you actually had to work because you have to pump the water. And so the toy wasn't fun and they hadn't tried it before they installed it. So um, if, and they contrast it with other charity projects who, for instance, uh, hand out mosquito nets in malaria areas. So if you hand out a mosquito net for free, then um, uh, hopefully most of the mosquito nets you, you hand out will be hung up above children's beds and they will not get uh, bit by malaria um, mosquitoes. And uh, the mosquito nets are pretty cheap. And um, this, is a, uh, this is what they call an effective form of altruism because uh, it's cheap and the um, chance of saving a children's life is high. And the other thing that giving out mosquito nets has is that it's easy to measure that it actually is effective. So you know exactly um, how many nets you're giving away and you know exactly um, how many lives this is going to save. And they have a website where you can see if you're going to give to a charity, uh, what will be what will probably be most effective. Um, and another uh, thing that these effective altruism movement uh, hits on is, well, how can you be most effective? So one way is to do something very predictable, like these mosquito nets. Um, uh, the other thing is always do your research. Don't just start building these pumps that, and then after two years conclude that it doesn't work. Um, but the third thing is to say, well, if you can do something that will have an impact for a long time, then that multiplies the impact of your work. So if you, um, um, if you give somebody fish, then they eat now, but if you teach them to fish, then they will eat for many, many days. So if, they, if a person has another uh, 10,000 days to live, then if you can do a small thing that will change every next day of their lives, or you do a big thing that just changes today, then the big thing, would have to be 10,000 times bigger to have the same impact as a small long-term thing. So in general, anything you can do that's longer term usually trumps anything you can do uh, short term. And um, mostly what effective altruism is applied to is how, when you give to charities. So, um, but, but the other thing uh, that it looks at is, well, you as a person, instead of working a, day a random day job and then donating part of your salary to a charity, maybe you can do something charitable yourself. And uh, you can also measure the, um, the trade-off in that. So um, there's this website called 80,000 Hours, which uh, states that you have 80,000 hours in your professional life. And how can you measure, how you, can you maximize the impact that your work has on the world Assuming that that's what you want to do, you can also maximize uh, how rich you will get yourself. Um, but um, uh, I think for most people, you know, you want to have a comfortable salary, and beyond that, you just want to do something uh, that's fun to do and that also has a big impact. Um, and um, if you uh, combine that with the long-term uh, uh, factor then um, 
my question to you is, um, what would your impact of the, the work you do now, or, or will do in the next five years or so, have in a hundred generations from now? So if you think in the long, long, long term future, and uh, you'll notice how I'll slowly go towards the topic of open source and, and uh, decentralized uh, solutions. Um, you could, for instance, I don't know, um, sell ice cream. That has a very high fun factor to the person getting the ice cream that lasts for five minutes. You could also build cars um, and a car probably lasts 10 years, right? So you make people happy for 10 years. You could make buildings, maybe that last for a hundred years. Um, but if you think of, um, the, if you think back a hundred generations, um, so round about the year zero, what could you have done then that will still impact us now? Um, I can think of one person who impacts us from 2000 years ago uh, by um, teaching uh, how to love each other. And uh, but so basically spreading an idea, evangelism. Uh, I guess that's actually the, that's the evangelist that the word evangelism came from. Um, but in general, um, writing a book or writing something that is freely available and permanent is I think the most long-term thing you can do. And if you translate that to our world, then I think there are two things we can do um, that would have a long lasting effect. So one is writing software and um, the other one would be um, spreading consciousness about topics, so spreading ideas or um, uh, evangelism. Um, so uh, there are obviously many things you can do in your work. Uh, and uh, I, th I assume most of you are software engineers. There's, um, um, I forgot who it was, but they, uh, somebody who worked at Facebook who said um, uh, the best minds of our generations are of our generation are lost to make people click on ads and i think that's true for a lot of uh, big tech companies um and probably if you're at the swarm uh, summer school then uh, you chose not to work at a big tech company so you're already uh, in um sort of in the alternative field uh but i think it's very important to think of what you want to as, as a as a software engineer you cannot be politically neutral. Uh, you cannot just say, oh, I just write the software that my boss tells me to write, and then just not care about whether that software goes into, um, into a bomb or into surveillance software. Uh, you have, by writing software, you have a responsibility to think about how your work impacts the world. Um, and um, uh, I, th I think it's an important thing to think about. So thinking about your own career and the effectiveness of the altruistic effectiveness of your work, um, I'd like you to fill in a, uh, a poll on uh, this website, www.menti.com. And then you fill in this code. Um, so I'd like you all to go to that website now and fill in that code and then I can uh, I have to, uh, now I have to, yeah, there. Uh, so the question is, how can you have the biggest impact? And um, I put three options here. Uh, it's obviously a bit leading. Um, so one way to have an impact is earn to give. And sometimes that is the best uh option there was uh, in this book i read about effective altruism there was a doctor who wanted to go to africa to you know heal kids there and um uh he decided he actually made a calculation a uh, mathematical calculation of how many lives he would save by being there for moving there for a few years with his family and uh well, the other option of just working in um uh, wherever in Chicago or where he was. Um, and um, 
Uh, can you please share the code again? Yes, uh, I have a problem clicking between Zoom and my screen share. The code is uh, right here. Um, there's uh, the other option was to just work as a doctor at a hospital and um, to earn a lot of money and then give that money to a charity so that other people could uh, change the world in uh, in the poorest countries. And that is a that is a realistic uh, uh, conclusion. And sometimes it's um, it's good to, you know, you can say I, I have a, I pick it, I choose a job or a project that maybe doesn't have such a big impact, but I know it's going to make a lot of money. And then I can um, uh, donate that money to, for instance, uh, malaria nets. I'm seeing, I'm, I'm not convincing anybody yet of the earn to give uh, model. I guess that's a bias because you're already in the in the Swarm Summer School. So you already want to build stuff that makes an impact. Um, it's interesting to see that so many of you think that uh, um, you can have the biggest impact by raising awareness. Um, I'd expect more people to say write software. Um, so it's it's uh, it's mainly for you to think about like how am I choosing what I can do, and um, yeah, to be aware of that. As why am I getting into this uh, swarm-based um, software development project? So. Um, I'll continue with the uh, slides presentation here. So, um, there's um, combining these things together uh, for me got to uh, when I um, uh, when I thought about what I want to work on, I get the conclusion that open source software is important because if I work at a company where I write closed source software, then I'm helping this company to sell a product. But as soon as this company disappears, then the value that I produced is lost again. Whereas if I contribute to open source software, there's only one pool global pool of open source software where um, different projects fill different uh, niches and projects do um, appear and disappear and they merge and they um, succeed each other. Um, but this is one um, communal process where whatever you contribute will help one of the current open source projects to become better. And the next generation of open source project will build on the on the current ones. And so by uh, contributing to open source software now, you are contributing to the, um, the global uh, uh, software pool of humanity that can only grow and, and help us uh, become more effective in, in what we want. Um, and the second thing I wrote down is open networks. Uh, of course, when you write software, um, there is a, this software will be uh, um, run under the control of users or under uh, the control of enterprises as part of services. They will also um, create networks, network effects. So um, maybe the software is set up to only interact with itself. Um, and uh, that creates a network right away. Um, or maybe there is just, uh, there's an intention to make the software uh, compatible and federated with other pieces of software, uh, but there's just not enough um, execution on that intention. And that means that even um, uh, that you still create closed networks. And I think the highest value can be achieved if all the networks are internetworked 
into a global network. Um, so that's why I think if there are ways to build open network, uh, open networks, that is an important thing um, to work on, maybe even more so than open, uh, open source software itself, which are just the implementations of the protocols of these networks. So um, the to create open networks, you need to develop protocols or agree on protocols and you, um, Yes, sorry, those are really the two things. You need to develop the protocols and you need to agree on them. And uh, sometimes there's a, uh, I was gonna write open protocols there, um, but just writing protocols in itself is not useful. You also need to agree on using them and they need to be flexible enough to allow different people to, to want to use them. Uh, but they also need to be strict enough so that they actually create interoperability. Um, and open formats is maybe a higher layer of the same thing. Um, so in open networks, I'm thinking of who you interact with. And open formats, I'm thinking of which pieces of software you interact with. So um, you, uh, you could have an open network where you share files. But then if each file is in a different format, you need to convert it before you can use it that's still not useful. So I think these three things are um, important ways to, uh, to build good software, to build good computer tools to, uh, to help humanity achieve its goals. Um, it may be a bit cryptic um, because I tried to choose these high level words, but maybe it'll become clearer if I um, give the examples of what I worked on myself over the years. Um, so I'd want to just uh, go into sort of storytelling mode where I just tell you what I did and how it was and uh, what I enjoyed and uh, just as like a telling a, a anecdotes at a, a campfire. So um, uh, there's uh, uh, in um, Hi, Robert, did you want to say, interrupt something or? or I, was, I was indeed uh, curious if you could highlight in those stories uh, whether the, your, your philosophy you just described, how it um, materialized into these projects and why. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I hope it's obvious from the topics of the project. Uh, so to me, it was, uh, there's a, there's the motivation. So this first part was about the motivation for how can you impact the world? And then, um, yeah, the second part is how I, uh, did that in past projects. And then the third part is about federated bookkeeping. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll try. So it started when I was, uh, working at a, a social network site in, um, in Spain, uh, it was sort of a Spain only version of Facebook. And um, there was a colleague of mine who's, uh, the, the, the Chromebook had just been launched and a colleague of mine said, well, you know, this new Chromebook is pretty cool, right? But um, it's also pretty dark, you know, because um, if you realize what Google's trying to do to us and I had no idea because, you know, we were all there um, hoping that one day we could work at Google and that would be just the coolest uh, uh, career path that we could think of. Uh, like you were allowed to move from Madrid to, uh, to Silicon Valley and work at a big tech company. That would be really a, a, the definition of success for us. And um, uh, um, there was, we, yeah, we still thought of Google as the, when they started with the don't be evil um, meme that they sort of, left round, round about that time. Um, and he said, well, the reason that they're launching the Chromebook is that it, it doesn't have a hard disk. So normally when you use a laptop, it will have a hard disk where you store your, um, your files. And um, this is a laptop that you can use and it feels like you're using uh, just your laptop with your local file system. But instead of a file system, you have the cloud. And that's what it's designed to do. It's an interface to the cloud. And so it helps us to store our data in the cloud under Google's control. 
Um, and um, that's obviously, Google wants to do that so that they can uh, target more advertising to us, uh, making people click on ads. And it's obviously not good for the user because uh, you want to be in control um, of your data and your, uh, your digital integrity, as we saw in the first presentation. And um, it was sort of a wake up call to me. So I, we uh, started to sort of brainstorm like, oh yeah, but you know, what, what could we, can we do something to change this? Could we just build a prototype of a, a better internet? And um, then I uh, started thinking about this more and I came across this presentation from uh, Eva Moglin, uh, the same year, this was 2010. And um, in this presentation, Eva Moglin is the, uh, um, important partner of uh, Richard Stallman at the law, um, Free Software Law Institute, I think it's called, something like that. And um, he gave this presentation, Freedom in the Cloud, where he explains exactly that. Like, yeah, these companies want to, they give you services, but they really want your data. And uh, they want to take away your uh, digital sovereignty. And uh, that is their business model. They want to, they build platforms which uh, just lock you in. And um, he gave this talk at the Debian conference uh, to um, an audience of Debian contributors. And he said, well, let's take a, a plug computer, like a small computer. This was Raspberry Pi didn't exist yet, but you already had uh, small computers that you could plug in uh, just a wall socket and um, that you could use as a local file store. And you could run some services on there and some um, uh, firewall and peer-to-peer -peer software. And, uh, that's, and, and that's when he proposed the Freedom Box project. And um, there were more projects that year. There was Diaspora, there, was, uh, uh, there were uh, projects that, about personal data stores. And um, I thought, well, let's try to, uh, with this colleague, this friend, I said, well, let's try to build something where uh, people stay in control of the data they upload. And the data that you upload is actually not sent to a central server, but it's distributed peer to peer. And um, I uh, took some time off work to try to build that. And I ended up building a, um, uh, the unhosted project, which is a separation of applications and data. And um, there, were some, there was some web, um, web platform technology that was just new where you could, uh, do cross origin requests from one website to another. And um, there could be uh, a, a website that acts as an application, but instead of creating an account in their database, you would tell this application, you would tell this website, well, my data store is there and connect my data store from the browser cross origin. So that was the idea of the unhosted project. You take the application into the browser and you make a connection from the browser to the user's data store. So bring your own data store to a website. Um, it's the idea of personal data stores um, implement using implemented in the, in the browser basically. And um, I got some, uh, some good feedback for that from a, a journalist wrote about it and it got onto Hacker News. And then I went to the uh, open source conference and people told me, well, you could really with, with the Twitter followers you have now, you could really crowdfund this and quit your day job. And I didn't believe them, but somebody else said, oh yeah, definitely. And then said, okay, well, if two people say it, then I'll just try it. And um, uh, I had 6,000 euros left in my bank account and I moved to Berlin and I said, well, I'll live off a thousand euros a month uh, so I can run this project for six months. But for every thousand euros that you donate, I'll add one month to the project. And uh, that crowdfunding campaign raised, we printed t-shirts with this uh, logo on it and uh, the crowdfunding campaign raised 4,000 euros. So that was for another four months. And then the NLNet Foundation, uh, the same foundation to which Radically Open Security uh, donates their 90% uh, of their profits, uh, funded my project. Uh, which means that I could work on it. Uh, they funded it multiple times and I could work on it for five years uh, before the funding ran out. So that was great. Um, it was a great time, got lots of fun and I didn't have to think about uh, how to make money. I could just focus on how to 
uh, improve the narrative about what we were trying to change and to write code and example apps and try to get people into um, uh, building unhosted web apps. And uh, we did it together. So that's me um, on the, the viewer's right. In the middle is uh, uh, Kenny, the guy who made this remark about the Chromebook to me, who inspired me to, uh, to think about it in the first place. And on the left is Jan, who works at Nextcloud now. And um, this is on our uh, the first anniversary of the project. We went to a, we found out that the in hills in the hills of Bohemia, there's a village called Unhost, which is the first six liters of unhosted. So we thought we should just go there. Uh, so we went there a few years in a row for our uh, conference. Tiny village, but funny that it had the same name. Um, Another thing we did uh, as, you know, because we didn't have to think about money, uh, the money came in from donations and we didn't have customers, we just have the open source uh, goals. Um, we could just go anywhere, we're just digital nomads, right? Just a laptop and a backpack. And then at some point we said, uh, I would go to Southeast Asia in the winter. And I met some other people who did the same thing, but then in the summer, maybe you still want to be in Berlin to meet some programmers again. And then we said, why don't we all go to the same tropical island? Yeah, that would be great. So we went to the same tropical island. We called it Hacker Beach. So we um, created a Twitter account and um, said, well, let's uh, this year, let's go to Phu Quoc in Vietnam and uh, let's all go to the same island. So it's totally unorganized, just people with laptops uh, uh, sitting at beach uh, restaurants. And uh, this January is going to be the 10th edition of uh, Hacker Beach. So if you're a digital nomad, that uh, you can find them on um, uh, on IRC or on Twitter and uh, say that you want to join and uh, vote on where to go. And uh, it's all, all the month of January. It's just hackers on the beach. It's a great, uh, great fun experience. And so, um, what we worked on uh, was really the idea of a personal data store. So allow people to control their personal little file system in the cloud. Um, and uh, the, so the, that first part is easy to give somebody a file server. You just now you run a server with a user database. You say, okay, here people can have a, an account. Um, the model we used was uh, the, the federated model. So uh, different services offer um, personal data store service and you can just switch, but it's based on um, the domain name. So your, your personal data store has a URL and um, the freedom comes from the fact that you can switch and you could also self host. It could even just be, if you have a static IP address, it could even be in your house. Um, so it was not as decentralized as Ethereum, but still decentralized enough to uh, decouple the data storage from the applications. And um, I worked on the Unhosted project for five years and then I worked on Firefox OS, which was uh, Mozilla's attempt to create a smartphone operating system, uh, or, or they did create this. Uh, they stopped the project because not a lot, not enough apps were HTML only uh, to keep the phone attractive. Uh, but it was a great project, and we learned a lot from that. Um, and after that, I uh, also worked on the Solid project with uh, Sir Tim Berners Lee which is very similar to the unhosted project in that it gives people a personal data store and it, it allows people to control, to choose like my data is at michieldeong.com or my data is at this service, which I trust, or it's my Dropbox, uh, et cetera. And um, the difference between solid and unhosted is that solid is also uh, aimed at linked data and uh, from a semantic web perspective. So the data that you store in a solid pod would normally be a lot of linked data uh, uh, with uh, uh, subject, predicate, object, triples, and knowledge stored that way in a, in a machine readable way. Um, and in an unhosted personal data store, you maybe uh, store more just JSON. Um, so the problems we ran into is really, well, one big problem is who cares? So a lot of people who were, so developers, would try it out, right? They would get a personal data store. Um, 
but it was hard to really interest uh, a larger group of people to sign up, especially if we would ask money for it. So um, there were not so many people who, who cared that, that much about having a personal data store. I think that did change a little bit in the last 10 years. There's much more awareness now in the general public about, for instance, end-to-end -end encryption. Um, but uh, at this time, uh, it was it was pretty hard to find actual lots of enthusiasm, but not so many real users. And especially the fact that the service has to be the storage has to be paid for makes it hard. Um, and I guess you'll get the same problem with uh, with Swarm that uh, you, somebody has to pay and um, uh, there's or, or contribute uh, to the hosting costs. And um, there's an added barrier, just the payment, the action of the payment is a, is a UI barrier. Uh, and I guess with Swarm that you, yeah, you first you have to um, uh, get into the, the right tools to actually be able to pay for it. Um, and maybe our biggest um, the problem that we underestimate who built, who builds the apps. Um, and um, there was, we built some apps, but we uh, focused mainly on um, providing the, uh, the SDK and making it easy for other people to build the apps. And then we did hold uh, hackathons a bit like this uh, summer school. We didn't have any uh, grants to give away, but uh, there, and there were about 20 apps built for uh, unhosted web apps. Uh, and um, uh, but really not enough to really attract a lot of users. And the feedback we got from app developers was often that like, yeah, it's one thing to build an app and then it's harder to build it on top of personal data stores uh, because uh, you might not be able to search the database or change the schema like you could in a normal um, uh, LAMP or, or Ruby on Rails or uh, Django stack. Um, and um, the third thing is that the sign up for their users becomes harder. So they say, yeah, use my app. Oh, first you need a personal data store, otherwise you can't sign in. And so that's confused. And then you have to choose because you want to give the users the choice of where their data is stored. So that makes the UX, the sign up a lot harder. Um, and um, anyway, those are some of the questions we ran into. Uh, the protocols that we, so Rebo Storage is the, uh, the wire protocol of the Unhosted project. And um, uh, WebDAV is the one where people say, well, why don't you just use WebDAV, which is used by, for instance, Nextcloud and uh, OwnCloud and most personal cloud uh, servers, where um, the difference between a personal data store and a personal cloud server is not that big, but a personal cloud server has the uh, is mainly as thought of as a file server with apps on there, so the apps are on there. And a personal data store is just the storage of other apps, so it's really a backend to other apps. And a personal cloud server is more integrated. Um, but in both cases, it's about uh, choosing where you store where your data is stored. And um, Solid has its own uh, protocol. And um, recently, we wrote the uh, test suite for Solid. And uh, we also uh, wrote a plugin for, um, for Nextcloud, which makes a Nextcloud server Solid compatible. So um, that's sort of the next step of open networks. So we take these protocols, these personal data store protocols, and then make personal data stores interoperable with each other. Um, because I guess there will never be one single uh, system for personal data stores. Um, or maybe, yeah, maybe one day there will be a dominant one, but uh, not anytime soon. So a good thing we can do now is to make them interoperable. For instance, with uh, server-side plugins or um, with client-side uh, um, uh, polyfills or uh, abstraction layers. Um, and it's, uh, it's good to know that the, um, when I started in 
look at personal data stores and try to, you know, build a more data fair internet. Um, there was crowdfunding was just new then, so there was um, um, that the diaspora crowdfunding raised two hundred thousand dollars. That was big news, and then so there was some awareness about crowdfunding, and uh, there were some grants, um, and so it was just possible to just say, okay, I'm going to run an open source project. Um, but now the, um, the landscape is actually much better, especially in the EU as well, thanks to the Next Generation Internet um, Initiative. And um, I think it's, um, there's, it's partially due to the uh, mainstream awareness that's really grown um, especially also after the Snowden revelations and um, um, uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, more and more mainstream press has been thinking about um, data aware uh, applications and, and networks. Um, but also the EU has realized that, um, yeah, it can't just let all its citizens data sit in the hands of American companies and so the EU wants to stay a little bit sovereign in that um, sense. And also um, the EU wants the internet to stay human centric. Um, and I uh, think it's worth, worth taxpayers money to donate to next generation. So NGI stands for next generation internet um, uh, funding pot. So the way NGI works is it's split up into a number of um, the, uh, funds, each of them are about 6 million euros. One of them is DUPSI, where I'm in the advisory, advisory board, and DUPSI stands for Data Portability uh, Solutions or Systems, I don't know, some S, uh, incubator. Um, and the goal of DUPSI is to give money to projects that improve the portability of data. So, um, the, it's, uh, it relates to the, the, the personal data store interoperability that I mentioned earlier, but you could think of it as a higher layer of data freedom. So first of all, you choose where your data is. That is the personal data store. Then you say, okay, now I want personal data stores to be interoperable uh, because I don't want to be locked into one specific type of data store. So that's the, at the protocol layer. Um, and then the third, so yeah, so, and the third thing is when the data is in there, I want the different applications that use that data to store the same data in the same way. So this links back to my earlier slide of open source, open networks and open format. Um, it's about, uh, you want your, an open source service software that can host your data uh, and you want uh, so that you can choose where your data is. And you want um, the protocols to be interoperable so that there is an open network, there's one open network of personal data stores. And you want um, open data formats so that if you have, for instance, a photo app that stores a photo and then a um, photo album app that allows you to create a photo album, that those two Stored um, uh, actually, well, uh, image format is a bad example, maybe. Suppose you have contacts data. So uh, you have data about your friends in your address book, and you store your address book on your personal data store. Uh, and then you have a different app, for instance, the chat app, um, where you want to be able to open a chat with somebody. And then maybe uh, maybe it can say see that you have 37 contacts in your address book. Um, and it can display the names, but maybe the avatar is just broken in this app because the app you store the data with uses a field called avatar and the apps you're reading the data with uses a field called profile picture. And it doesn't know that avatar and profile picture are the same thing. That's the data format problem. So um, data format problem is a huge problem in any type of software interoperability. Um, even between versions of the same piece of software, you get this problem. You want you, you always have data migrations where you um, have to reshape the data 
to work with a new version of the software. But between um, pieces of software, it's even harder because no, everybody just goes and write their own thing. Um, it's even happened to me that I wrote an application that was not even compatible with an er early, earlier application that I wrote myself, just because you know I went from a different design principle and ended up storing the data in a different way. That's um, that makes personal data stores almost useless. So if we can't get port, uh, the, um, the data formats to be interoperable, then it's almost useless that you control where your data is if you can't read it out with other applications. And so one way, one approach to solving that is with schemas and shapes. And um, that's been tried since the 90s, you know, with XML um, data, uh, or what's it, XSD and XSLT, et cetera. Um, and a lot of research has been gone into how you can describe your know, ontologies that describe a data format and that this restrict and validate a schema. Um, and then, um, but the problem with that is that, yeah, sure, it's good to formalize and to validate the data format, but then what you get is two applications that just use different schemas. So you still have the same problem at that level. So um, what I think now, and it's sort of a, a school of thought in, in data portability is that you should always um, let the data, um, you shouldn't try to uh, choose one best schema that everybody wants to use. You just have to document in which schema the data is and then have conversions um, when uh, you read the data. Um, so the app that reads the data should be able to read data from dozens of formats. And this is, um, uh, there's a, a, it's related to a trend in, in data warehousing in general, where, uh, uh, for instance, big enterprise software packages look at uh, uh, data logs from big systems. They used to call it a data warehouse. And then somebody said, well, let's not think of, um, instead of thinking of a data warehouse, let's think of a data lake where we don't store the um, converted uh, curated data, but we just store the raw data um, in its source format and then um, apply the schema on read. So, um, try to have, you can have data in many different data formats and the effort should be in making your application able to read data from as many other applications as possible. And of course, uh, you want that reading uh, part of your software that is obviously a, a, a part of your software that you can reuse. So then you can um, have these transformations uh, uh, um, exist in, in software libraries that you reuse. Uh, that th the risk there is that somebody tries to say, well, let's uh, convert from 30 different formats to this one super new format. And then um, uh, that's, of course, trying to propose a single format again. Um, but uh, so it's, it's an almost, it's, it's necessarily hard problem to solve, but it's a problem that you will have to try to solve if you want to give people uh, um, data sovereignty, because uh, your application will be storing data and you want other applications to read to be able to read it. And your application should be able to allow people to switch to it from other um, uh, formats. And uh, so it should also read other existing formats. So if you do anything to do with data portability, you can apply for this grant. Uh, uh, there's another call open next month where you can get 150,000 euros if you have a good proposal. Um, data portability incubator from next generation internet. So um, maybe I primed you a little bit, but my next question is about uh, what is important in um, with regards to how data is stored. So um, I wrote down four options. Uh, and uh, so the first one would be portability. So if you want to, uh, uh, so to, a, to an end user, 
or to humanity as a whole, the most important thing, is it that data is portable um, or is it that data is confidential? And um, this includes, uh, confidentiality includes uh, protection from uh, state surveillance. So uh, I guess that's a big motivator for people to use Swarm would be that, yeah, the, and then the NSA can't get to it if it's encrypted. Um, availability, obviously um, uh, you want data to stay avail available. That's why otherwise you just put it, um, you could keep it on your own laptop and you wouldn't have to do all these complicated things, uh, storing it in the cloud. Um, and this includes censorship resistance because if your data is censored, then it's no longer available. And um, the fourth one I put in there is attribution. And um, attribution about when you create something that is of value to others, you want to be, um, uh, you want it to be known that you uh, contributed it. So it's like you wrote a song, you want people to know it's your song. It's just nice, you know, it feels good to hear that people liked your song. And, um, uh, part of attribution is monetization. And I think when you create content, it's important that if you create content as a full-time activity, that you need some way to make money with, uh, off that. And um, the way it works, the classic web uh, business model is to say, I'm gonna put my content online and I'm gonna put ads on it. That's the classic business model. And then so, that leads to user surveillance because then the ads get make more money. And so that's a business model we don't want. But how do you monetize um, creations uh, if not through ads? So there's uh, another good grad that you could apply for, uh, for its grant for the web. Um, grant for the web does assume that you use uh, their um, web monetization standard and uh, it's which is linked to Interledger, which again is sort of linked to XRP, but um, the ideas behind it are very general, like how can we create a different business model for the web? Um, linked to Brave browser obviously as well and uh, Flutter. And um, um, yeah, so in the way your app stores data, which aspects it, do you want to improve most compared to classic big tech compared, compared to Google Drive? Uh, what does your app do better? Is it data portability, data confidentiality, including state censorship, uh, sorry, state surveillance um, resistance? Is it availability, including censorship resistance, or is it attribution, including monetization? So we can go to the same menti.com website um, the same code, and I'll um, go to the next poll here. Uh, yeah, data awareness, what matters most? The code is here. Oh, sorry, six, seven, four, six, nine, seven, three, six. Let's see what people say. Cool. Looks like uh, confidentiality is the winner there, which is uh, yeah. So it's it's, uh, it's interesting. It's uh, sort of to expect it, I guess, uh, but it's interesting to me um, as I'm not from the Swarm project, and so maybe I hadn't thought of it that much. Um, but it's really cool to see 
Uh, and yeah, I agree that with, uh, uh, actually with the first speaker uh, emphasized this as well, that uh, it's not about the, um, the nothing to hide argument. It's about um, your safe home uh, in the digital world uh, should just be uh, in integral and should not be uh, snooped on. Cool. Well, great to see uh, how you all think uh, about that question. Uh, I've got another open question uh, coming up soon, and then you'll just, um, I hope we can do that with a Zoom or where people can just actually talk. Um, but I'll um, continue with my um, and, uh, a, a little bit more of my projects that I worked on, and then we'll get to uh, how you want to structure your project. So one project I quickly wanted to mention now was Terms of Service in Read. Uh, Robert already mentioned it in introduction. And this is a, uh, uh, a raising awareness project that uh, in the first uh, Mentimeter uh, scored highest, uh, higher than uh, writing code. Uh, raising awareness. So that's actually all that Terms of Service in Read does. Uh, we crowd read the terms of service and the privacy policy of big websites. Um, it's, uh, which is something nobody does. You know, it's the biggest lie on the web where you tick the box and say, yes, I have read and agreed to the terms of this uh, website. You just wanna create the account and obviously you didn't read it. So um, we, um, uh, as a pun on uh, TLDR, we created a TOSDR and actually started reading them and then uh, rating all the paragraphs. So we had some labels where I said, okay, this is a class action waiver. This is about how long they keep the logs. And then from all these tags, we created a rating and then uh, it ends up with a uh, label of class A uh, for very good or class B, C, D, E, uh, E is very bad. And um, this started eight years ago as sort of a side project and then we kept doing it. We took over the toss back project from the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, Tosback crawls the terms of service every day because uh, lots of terms of service say we can change them unilaterally and you can uh, you have to check back to this site. Uh, that's tosback.org. And um, I just heard this morning that we're on Hacker News again with the uh, terms of service didn't read project. So it's great to, there's a new, I'm no longer directly involved in it. There's uh, since last year, there's a new team working on it and a new crowd for the third crowdfunding campaign. Um, so that was anyway, that was my awareness uh, project that I worked on. Uh, and that I, um, before I moved more to um, um, money systems, if you will. So um, what I work on now is Ponda Source. Uh, and uh, as I said, I had a, uh, a startup incubator where Melanie Rubeck gave a talk and I decided to make it a nonprofit organization. Um, but then still there were some uh, choices to make about the details. And um, one of the questions I asked like, yeah, should it be investor owned? Well, I guess that's uh, already answered that with no, but then what a lot of, um, innovative uh, business models do is they are sort of co-ops, cooperatives. So they are worker owned. And um, a lot of um, nonprofit uh, companies are, for instance, let's they say, oh, let's be like Uber, but owned by the drivers. And um, then I thought, well, why would it have to be owned by the drivers or even owned by the workers? Um, there are some very good examples of factories that were owned by the factory workers, for instance, so they could vote about how it should work. But in the software company, I still think that worker owned is not good enough um, because uh, as workers, we, uh, we get a salary and we get our bonus scheme and we get our pension scheme. And uh, that we should, by that, with that, we should be re have been rewarded. We get our attribution, importantly. And then from that point on, um, we the exchange is done. You know, we done our work and we got paid for it. And if I, um, uh, I shouldn't be able 
to then later say like, oh, I had this, I created this ad blocker and uh, it's uh, open source, but it's mine. And now I'm gonna sell it. And the ad blocker becomes a uh, advertising plugin. Um, you know, even if I wrote it, when you open source something and you actually, you really donate your software to the commons um, of, uh, to the common good of humanity, then I feel that you have a right to attribution. So people should always know that it was you who wrote that software and they should praise you for it. You get the applause. Um, but if you really um, release your software into the public domain, then you should no longer be the owner of it. Then it should just be owned by the public domain. Owner in the sense of uh, who can shut it down or who can sell it, uh, etc. And um, that's why we went for a foundation owned. So, uh, and I've been, uh, I thought it was, we were gonna make it a, a co-op, but then in the end, uh, I decided, I, I thought about the fundraising um, uh, institute construction. Um, and that was a bit too altruistic for me. I, or with too, not, that's not the right words. It was giving away too much control. So I thought, okay, we're gonna do earn to give project. So we have a, a balance between projects and products. Uh, in projects, we get paid for the hours we work and that's the stable basis of the company. And in products, we develop something new, which maybe in two years from now will make us some money or not. And um, sometimes we just do things that we don't, that cost us money, uh, but we think they have to be done. So uh, within Pondersource, we balance those things. So uh, we have a few projects that we find important, but that make us money. And we have a few projects that we also find important, but that cost us money. And um, in this balance, there's a, uh, uh, yeah, once we've done this work, uh, we release the software into the public domain, and then we should no longer be able to, uh, to control what happens with it. Um, there's, um, uh, okay, so my next slide is, uh, sorry, one slide ahead. So we have a, um, the way we did it in the end, so it's not a bonus, uh, it's not a, uh, sorry, not a cooperative, but we do have a bonus structure. I think because, um, um, yeah, this is sort of proven to work well in uh, VC funded startups. Uh, the idea that you have a small team and you have uh, 360 reviews of the um, people, uh, you review your manager, your manager reviews you, and if it goes well, you get a bonus, so that motivates people. And you don't want to give that away. Um, you could, and if you could make a totally volunteer led project, which, you know, the unhouse project was, and um, that's uh, nice because it doesn't cost any money, but it's also hard if you can never tell, uh, if you cannot coordinate what people work on and, uh, uh, and you cannot align um, people's goals as well uh, with volunteers as with uh, uh, people who are committed to um, uh, and rewarded for uh, reaching company goals. Um, so there is a bonus, uh, there's salary and a bonus uh, if we reach the quarterly goals. There's no ownership and everything we do is for the commons. And um, so my question to you as the audience, uh, and I don't know, I guess I need Robert to uh, uh, unmute people if they wanna answer this. I got two questions. Um, so when you think of your project that you're gonna build on top of Swarm, uh, who will decide so um, who will own the keys to the future of the project and who will profit? Uh, you know, are you gonna, uh, um, I guess ICOs are, uh, uh, I don't know if they're legal anymore, but if you, maybe you want to have some sort of reward where uh, the software development is paid for. Um, <clears throat> so how will the profit structure work and how will the decision structure work in the governance of your uh, swarm based project. Yeah, uh, thank you. You can uh, ask uh, or uh, respond via um, 
the chat. If you raise your hand in Zoom, then you'll be unmuted. To uh, otherwise, uh, we'll also keep keep in touch with the Discord channel and the QA section. But if you raise your hand, we'll give you the voice. In the meantime, again, um, if you do intend to build your uh, data aware and decentralized application, take a look at the uh, what is next generation internet um, uh, grants. And the other one was the grant web. Grant, grant for the web. Grant for the web. Very good. Could it be that and, uh, some people don't know yet uh, who will decide or who will profit? So did you, by the way, uh, given the infrastructure we have these days, uh, the opportunities with uh, decentralized solutions, did you think of making your organization a DAO to um, automate it that way? Um... Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I I didn't really consider that. I don't know really why. Maybe I should have considered it longer. Um, so um, yeah, good question. Uh, well, we need um, we need a legal structure anyway. Um, yeah, or we could be a DAO with freelancers. I guess. Yeah. Um, I guess I sort of automatically started searching in uh, the the traditional legal system for a uh, an employee structure. Um, one of the reasons is I guess it's easier to hire people in traditional uh, working contracts. Um, and uh, I did what I did. Um, uh, there were two things I did consider. One of them was freelancers, um, but I think that it's it's good to get good talent from freelancers. But it's hard to bind them and to build up a team and to build up a team feeling and uh, and a, and a flywheel. I think. Uh, but we do work with. Um, we do that a little bit. We have one freelancer, um, uh, which is just a friend I did previous project with. And um, uh, so yeah, repeated freelancer, which is sort of the uh, one, uh, you could also call it the co-working model. And co-working spaces are flexible offices, but they are also places where freelancers temporarily work on a project uh, or somebody find it like that to me once. And, um, the other thing we considered was uh, Git Bounty or Git, uh, was Git Tip and Git Bounty, uh, I think, and Bounty Hub. Uh, so just to give out bounties and um, uh, see if people would just write part of our code for a bounty. Um, but it, it felt scary. <laughs> I got uh, two questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both. Uh, open-ended. So um, first of all, from Gregor, really glad that among others, you mentioned how apps and data can become unbounded uh, as today, as users were convinced uh, that it's all the same. Still, this is quite abstract to end users. How do you think we can increase awareness? In your opinion, what are the biggest obstacles to adoption of the proposed paradigm change? Um... Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. If you do it well, then the user doesn't notice um, that the app is storing the data on Swarm or, or on a personal data store. And then it doesn't change um, the experience of the user, I think. But I think um, the, the aha moment for the end user is the second time they use an app uh, with that data store. Uh, that it's already pre-filled with the data they used from the first app. So um, for that to work, there have to be uh, two or more 
good apps that people would both want to use. Um, but if there are enough apps, then uh, I think that's a real um, uh, incentive for end users to use it. So that is um, of the four things you want to improve about data um, awareness that we voted on earlier. That's the portability one, where your data is portable from one app to another. Um, and for, um, yeah, for availability, you could think of uh, sort of a WikiLeaks uh, app. Um, you know, that's um, obviously when you have data um, that you don't want to be censored, that could uh, that could be a uh, pretty self-explanatory niche application. Um, and I think for confidentiality is hard because in practice people say, oh, that's so bad. I'm never going to use Facebook again. But then, then they do keep using Facebook because, you know, they're just using it. And while you're using it, you don't really care. And when you think about it, you do care. Um, it's like, well, yeah, when you think about how your chicken sandwich is produced, then if you think about it too much, you don't want the sandwich anymore. But if you don't think about it, you just eat it. Um, so that's the harder one. But I think portability is doable with two or more apps. Uh, for confidentiality, it's doable in a niche. Um, and um, the hard problem, I think, is the chicken and egg problem between apps and users. Because app developers want a lot of uh, users who have a data store on a given platform. And users want a lot of apps to be available before they're going to sign up. So that's, uh, and, and the way to break that cycle is, for instance, with grants, um, as Swarm is doing now. So I think that's a great, uh, great approach. Thank you. Um, and the other question was, um, you mentioned the interoperability between these different platforms. Uh, mm -hmm. And where do you see synergies between Swarm, the unhosted, and the solar project, if any? Um, well, I think uh, you could have, uh, you would have to write a, a polyglot uh, client library. So that, that talks all the APIs. And we've been doing that a little bit. We, um, so within the unhosted project, we created a client library that can also um, allows the users to store their data on Dropbox or on Google Drive. Um, and uh, then you could have apps that are compatible with not just uh, Swarm or not just Solid, but with both. And that would be really cool. Uh, so I think that would be, uh, should be doable. The, um, and then it's up to the user whether they want, so then their data would be safer in Swarm uh, than in Solid, because in Solid it's still hosted on a pod provider, which is still um, run probably on AWS, which still has the NSA, uh, still has a backdoor. Um, so uh, then Swarm is sort of the higher goal of the, the higher level of decentralization. Um, but you could, uh, um, yeah, you could imagine writing an app that's compatible with multiple storage uh, platforms. And then through that, there's a synergy because you know one app helps multiple storage platforms forward. Um, there are some technical hurdles, I guess, to get it to get that working because every you want to uh, the storage platform sort of dictates how the uh, how you're going to access the data. Um, but in theory, that should be a, that should be a way to have a synergy and awareness, obviously, um, just to uh, jointly uh, create awareness. I thought maybe there's somebody from the audience just want to talk just to say what their project will be or what they want to build or what their questions are. Somebody from the audience wants to say anything? Yeah, again, if you raise your hand, then uh, Gasper can give you the word. Yes, we have a question from Petra. So actually, you know, my project is kind of like developing tools to help new ways of deciding uh, who and, and how to distribute profit in particular. So um, it, pretty much in all information systems that we're dealing with, there are data sources 
and data syncs. And it's about you know, controlling or creating a system by which we share control of that transfer of information across the network. Um, and then how, you know, how is it propagated, but also how does it evolve and how is the attribution tracked by the system in a way that's anonymized or separated from the actual interaction with the system by the end user um, so that, you know, after the process comes along um, and there's a product from the process, then uh, as that's being consumed in the data sync, uh, that triggers back a feedback loop. Right. Uh, a lot of DAOs are are functioning in that kind of architecture. Um, and so I think uh, uh, I guess my my question to you would be, um, and it's related to this idea of um, uh, uh, intellectual uh, philanthropy or uh, effective uh, philanthropy, right? Um, one of the things I've run into in nonprofit organizations is that they tend to become dominated by uh, the sources of funding um, that are available to them. Um, even if the best of intentions from those organizations that are trying to be socially responsible by contributing to uh, those uh, non-governmental or non-profit uh, initiatives, um, there's a sort of social inurement that occurs uh, in, in these ideologies. So um, I guess, uh, it, you know, a, a lot of what's happening in Swarm right now, I think, is this uh, development of the idea of the difference between data and capital. Um, but, you know, uh, in cryptocurrency, we understand data is money. So I guess uh, that's kind of my question is how can we separate data and money from capital uh, with these new systems and these new architectures that we're developing here? Yeah, I think um, so personal data is uh, primarily for your own use until you share it as a user, as an end user. So there, um, data is not money, um, or at least it shouldn't be. Uh, it, it becomes money when potential advertisers get to look at it. Uh, but that's not the goal of why the application is storing your data. Um, and uh, there's on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's public data, which um, we want to be published in a censorship proof way, like you know the contents of Wikipedia. Uh, which I guess is the uh, the prime example of what will still have an impact um, 100 generations from now. Um, and there's when you contribute to the pool of public knowledge, then um, I think you probably want attribution. It's nice to sign your work. Um, so I'm interested in your idea of uh, anonymizing that part of it. Um, so as I understand, it's uh, you could contribute something um, and get money for it, but stay anonymous. So not get uh, applause for it. Well, you, I guess you could get applause under a pseudonym then, right? Um, so um, uh, yeah, and. There's a, in, when you contribute to public data, there's, there could be just a, um, uh, there's not a specific end user who profits from it. Uh, so you're not, there's no transaction. There's no receipt, there's no recipient because humanity is the recipient of the data you produce. That the data sync is the commons. Um, and, um, um, yeah, when you share contents with your audience, maybe as a creator, um, that's where you want to monetize it. So I think there it would be very useful to have just a way to uh, subscribe to a podcast, um, maybe on Swarm, uh, where um, the consumers of this podcast are just uh, paying to access it. And um, there, there's the... Um, 
you could pay for access, you could pay to um, just you could donate to a, an activity that creates data. Uh, you could also uh, contribute to the hosting uh, of the data to make sure it stays available. Um, so yeah, it sounds like a, a cool project where um, you make these things possible and you help people to set up these structures. I guess you want to give people all these options, um, you know, contribute to the hosting, uh, make it public, uh, pay for access. I guess when you say you have to pay to hear my podcast, you don't really want to exclude the people who don't pay. You just want to give them a reason to click pay before they consume. So another uh, almost equivalent model is there is that you can say you can consume it and then later donate. And something that has been done a lot um, is flat rate. So uh, started with Flatter, but Spotify does the same. And so does uh, uh, Coil with uh, who are partially behind Grant for the Web. Um, where you say, I, I just contribute $5 a month and that gets distributed over whichever data uh, the system says I have used. Uh, thank you, definitely, um, for your insights and the presentation. Thank you very much. Cool. <laughs> I'll, um, I, I've got a few more slides, but I see I only have seven minutes left. Uh, I wanted to, uh, Robert, can I use, just use these, um, last minutes to talk about federated bookkeeping. Uh, yeah, this might even uh, go into, might relate even to Petra's question in this case. I have one final question for you later on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'll get, uh, let me see, I'm, am I in my, yeah. Um, so there's, hold on, I have to, I have a problem controlling, uh, keynote and controlling Zoom if my pointer disappears. So federated bookkeeping, the idea is that what we don't want is banks, obviously. Um, and um, there's the idea that for Alice to interact, to send value to Bob, she has to go through a bank for an anonymous currency because the, um, the US dollar is backed by a war machine that will, and, and the police that will uh, collect taxes that will back the US dollar and um, this is an anonymized, anonymized bubble where Alice has a balance in dollars and Bob has a balance in dollars and um, you swap these for each other. But really what you wanna do is to keep track of what how Alice and Bob interact with each other. And you don't want the world to be about how Alice interacts just on her own with her bank and how Bob interacts on his own with his bank where you know every you get a model where the, the the structure of the world is made up by this bank and every user is isolated in a little pod um, in a big <laughs> matrix of little pods uh, where we dream uh, things that aren't real and we end up in the movie, the matrix. Um, that is what banks are. They separate us from each other and our only interaction is through this um, system. But, uh, a provocative uh, thing for um, uh, you Ethereum users is uh, I will argue that when you use cryptocurrency, that is also an anonymized um, currency. A, um, any cryptocurrency, uh, be it Bitcoin or Ethereum or XRP or whatever, is a bubble uh, that is uh, held up by um, uh, speculators and when I want to interact with you I interact with the bubble and you interact with the bubble and we could have just interacted with each other peer-to-peer -peer. Um, and so that's what I tried to uh, to build for the last five years or so is a, uh, a system where people can interact peer-to-peer. -peer. So I, I formulated the whispering merchants problem, which are these merchants sitting around a tree and everybody is only allowed to talk with their neighbor, direct neighbors, but you want uh, to exchange goods so that value goes all the way around the tree and uh, everybody receives something and everybody gives something. Um, 
and uh, a solution I uh, found for that was, well, actually I first invented a solution and I formulated the Whispering Merchant's problems to explain what my idea did. It's called Ledger Loops, uh, where you um, send a conditional transaction around the tree in one direction. And when it arrives back at you, you say, aha, it made a circle, so that's a uh, full circle, that's good. Then you send back the pre-image of the hash condition goes around the tree in the other way, um, direction, and then um, you have a two-phase commit of a circular uh, a chain of transaction. Then somebody pointed me to that, actually that's the same thing that Interledger does. And I later found out that Lightning Networks also does it. And there was an Ethereum-based uh, project for which I forgot the name that also uses um, hash time locked contracts to uh, create a two-phase commit where you do a multi-hop transaction in a peer-to-peer uh, -peer mutual credit network. And if you look at uh, Ripple Classic, which was original Ripple before XRP started, um, there was, uh, the idea was to create a credit network, sort of like a local economic trade system uh, but where everybody can issue currency and you can just send IOUs. And um, I've been researching that. Uh, I ended up working for Ripple in Luxembourg on the Interledger uh, protocol. And after that, I researched it some more and I, I uh, renamed it to Federated Bookkeeping. And it's the idea of, let's not talk about payments because payments imply that we're settling against a bubble. And, um, I want to talk about how we coordinate, uh, how we trade with each other, and how we coordinate what we give and what we take uh, to our environment. And that's just bookkeeping. A side effect is if you talk about payments, then you have to you fall under payments regulation. If you talk about bookkeeping, you don't fall under as much regulation. So um, it's easier to have a federated bookkeeping node running. Um, without uh, being um, falling under money laundering uh, law than, for instance, running an interledger node. Um, and the idea of federated bookkeeping is that you um, are, uh, you have your bookkeeping system, you send messages out, you receive messages in. These messages only have as much value as you assign to them based on how you trust your neighbors. But with repeat business um, by doing circular debt resolution in this network, you can um, have the same effect as a money network um, as long as the network's big enough. So um, we now have a weekly call. There are uh, usually there's five of us. We're sort of a, a team that formed around federated bookkeeping that brainstorms once a week. There's a Gitter channel. Um, if you go to federatedbookkeeping.org, you can get to the Gitter channel, and from there you can get to our weekly Jitsi call. Um, and um, this is our sort of novel idea where we say, well, yeah, okay, cryptocurrency is still bubble tech. What if we could connect bookkeeping systems peer to peer into a global network, uh, call it bookkeeping and not payment, and um, that way be connected but sovereign? So. You control your own data because it's your bookkeeping system, whether you host that uh, on a encrypted uh, system in your pocket or you host it at Amazon, that's your choice. You're, you can choose where you keep your bookkeeping. You could even do it on paper, uh, but it's connected through messages. And these messages can be used as well or better than payments to coordinate trade. Because if we pay each other, then we give a price signal, uh, which says I need what you made because I'm paying for it. So apparently I need it. But these price signals aren't that good. You know, sometimes we're lured into buying something which we don't really need. Um, also, it's just one number. So maybe um, through a bookkeeping message, I could tell you much more precisely what I need, or I could tell you conditionally what I need. So I could say, uh, I would buy this stamp from you uh, if you also have that one, because that would complete my series. Um, and so uh, you could do more complex, almost like smart 
um, expressions of uh, price signals, making the uh, and then the hard part, of course, is to to implement the the um, the invisible hand in this system so that uh, the value flows through it. Um, but the, the concept is that federated bookkeeping is a generalization of payments. And if you look at uh, how banks work and how money has worked since uh, the departure from the gold standard, uh, correspondent banking is really just bookkeeping. There's no um, uh, money move. No money is moved. Um, there's only uh, records that keep track of what people owe each other. It's only IOU records that change. Um, so the thing we talked about literally since last week is if we could do virtual organizations, this is part of Robert's earlier questions, have you considered being a DAO? Uh, so we started thinking about, could we do virtual organizations with attributions in a peer-to-peer -peer mesh? So could we use federal bookkeeping, federated bookkeeping as uh, uh, an alternative to DAOs? Um, and the answer is, I don't know yet. Uh, we're trying to work out what that would mean. Um, and um, uh, another thing we're doing is uh, to make ferret rate bookkeeping work is we looked at uh, how electronic data exchange works. And that's been worked on since the 80s. And people started saying paperless office. They said, well, we should stop sending paper invoices. And instead, people are now sending PDF invoices but since a few years, um, the EU has backed an e-invoicing network that is uh, becoming European. There were some national ones already. Um, it's called PEPL. And um, it, the architecture is uh, very top down. So in order to enter PEPL, you need to get certified as a gateway. Uh, you need to, um, uh, and, and then you check that the participants are legal entities, uh, legal, um, yeah, legal persons in a country. Uh, so that's very top down and government oriented. Um, but one project we're doing, which we wanted to call um, Pebble Direct, but we got called back saying, no, you can't call it Pebble because it goes against all the principles of Pebble if you remove the man in the middle. Um, so we called it AS4 Direct. AS4 is the underlying protocol of Pebble, one layer down. Um, so the idea of AS4 Direct is to say we do e-invoicing the way the EU proposes, but instead of using a four-corner model where you have to send to a sending gateway, which is certified, and that is allowed to talk to a receiving gateway that's also certified, and that will deliver to the recipient. Uh, so it's actually two men in the middle with every message that you send, which is sort of the opposite what any um, blockchain person would want to build. Uh, we say, well, we just use the same format. Uh, it's actually XML and SOAP, uh, which is fun and, and old fashioned, um, but uh, it works. And we use it directly from bookkeeping system to bookkeeping system. And in order to know that an invoice comes from the company you think it comes from, we use self-hosted identities where on your on the website or the, the endpoint of your bookkeeping system, you host your certificate, which shows who you are. Um, and um, we also want to link this to Pebbel so that sometimes you may send through, if you send to a government, you have to go through Pebbel. So there will be men in the middle. But if you send to a, a, a friend, um, to maybe a freelancer who also works on the project, um, then you can just send bookkeeping to bookkeeping or uh, send through a swarm message, for instance. Um, and then the next thing we want to do also to, and that's when this presentation comes through circle. I was afraid I didn't have enough slides for an hour and a half, but apparently I did. So uh, we're big fans of the Let's Encrypt project, um, which gives free SSL for everybody. Uh, I'm sure you know it. You can just uh, uh, run a script and you get an SSL certificate for your website. They have 285 million users who don't pay. Uh, and they have 95 donators, sponsors, who pay for the costs of running one server and a team, or one da big database server, uh, one small cluster of servers, and um, a team of, I think, 16 people. Um, so a very small team that's changing the world of 
HTTPS. And um, we want to do the same for Pebble. So as we're an earn to give company, we um, have two types of activities, projects and products. The projects make sure that we um, keep rolling and uh, that we have enough money. Um, one thing I, uh, that's maybe implied, but I didn't mention explicitly is that we ha we our team grows organically. So since we don't take venture capital, we can only hire the next person if there's enough money in the bank. Uh, we are uh, 2.2 persons now, and we want to move to 3.2 soon. Uh, but first we wait for our uh, project customers to pay some invoices, and then we will hire the third uh, full-time person. Um, and we also use our income from our projects to fund products, and that's how it's possible that we can give away products for free. And our main uh, project, that product that we're excited about, excited about is, well, it doesn't have a name yet. You could call it Let's Pebble because it'd be Let's Encrypt for Pebble. So um, right now it costs about 40 euros a month to get a Pebble ID. Um, and we've been talking to a number of certified Pebble providers and asking them for price information. And we're just gonna mix the cheapest ones and then uh, pay for that ourselves from our um, own profits and then give the Pebble connection away for free uh, so that everybody can get onto Pebble and we get electronic um, invoicing for everybody. And the invoicing, sending invoices is can be the basis of the federated bookkeeping so that uh, you can uh, keep track of, for instance, work you did in a project. Uh, when you fix an issue, you send a sort of invoice to the what would be the DAO um, and uh, to automate all of that. Also between um, uh, uh, machine uh, operated services. So you could have a automatic service that when you um, uh, send a purchase order, a server is started or a node in Swarm is started. Uh, and um, you could totally automate this bookkeeping process and create structures um, that sort of do business with each other in an automated way. Um, but in order to do that business, one way to try to achieve that is to say, well, let's do micropayments where services pay for each other. That's what, um, for instance, Codius does. And our approach is to, well, let's not do, use payments, but let's use bookkeeping. So just purchase orders and invoices that keep track of um, what these services need from each other and uh, when a new node needs to be spun up, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, that was it. Uh, thank you for your uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, uh, thank you for listening. Good luck with all your projects. Uh, I um, mentioned a bunch of projects, but uh, the one site uh, I love to see you is uh, federatebookkeeping.org um, and um, pondersource.org is our, uh, our nonprofit uh, company. And um, yeah, wish you all the best of luck with your Swarm projects. And uh, I don't know if we wanna uh, do questions or, uh, or wrap it up, I'll leave that to Robert. Yes, uh, to all participants, uh, don't leave yet. Um, we have some announcements to make. And I have one closing question for you, Michiel, um, which was, um, or is uh, from Chert. As you mentioned, oh, how, what, what, what impact can you make in uh, 2000 years, in 100 generations? What would be the lifetime of the decentralized technologies we're working with today? Will they stick around for another 2000 years or will they be gone in the next 10 years? What is your expectation on that? And you're, you're muted, by the way. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's interesting, especially if you think of uh, cryptocurrencies, that it would be so easy to just fork, uh, to say, I'm, 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 um, uh, instead of Bitcoin, we'll start using uh, Schmidt coin, and uh, that's just uh, start with a new um, Genesis block. Um, and if that happens, that all the money that was ever paid for bitcoins uh, will have been uh, will be gone because the value of Bitcoin would go to zero. Um, 
but as long as there's no reason to do so that will just not happen and, and we'll stick with the same cryptocurrencies that we have now um so i don't think that the current um um dlt networks will necessarily stay for a thousand years there'll be new ones uh that succeeded uh if you look at how many news new ones get created uh all the time um but the new ones will be inspired on the older ones so uh in that they they live on and then um all these inventions live in live on in the next generation so um i definitely think that um uh that smart contracts and uh um data aware apps and all the things that we're working on now are a change that in a hundred years we'll say oh yeah that's when they invented data aware apps that's when they invented swarm and uh, it'll be in history books um and um we will use something like swarm it might not be called swarm but um yeah i'm pretty sure that in 2000 years if we don't uh, bomb each other that we'll still be using something like swarm by then Thank you. Thank you for that.